Hi, everyone. So we are going to try to do a COVID-19 edition of Mrs. Posernick's lectures. So uh, this one is on the causes of the Great Depression, and this is topic 7.9 in the College Board. Um, I'm not as good as Adam Norris, and I'm not as practiced as Mr. Corcoran, but hopefully this goes okay. So if you remember when we left school, we had been learning about the 1920s. So we were learning about um, the innovations and in communications and technology of the 1920s. So things like magazines and mass advertising and the radio. We were also learning about cultural and political controversies of the 1920s. So things like the intolerance of the 1920s. So the Scopes Monkey Trial or the rise of the KKK, um, the fight between modernism and traditionalism of the 1920s, and then also political controversies. So if you remember the presidents of the 1920s, they were really very much about laissez-faire economics, um, less government regulation, letting businesses uh, make the decisions. And so as we come to the end of the 1920s, um, the United States is faced with a depression, which is the greatest or largest depression that um, the United States had dealt with to this point. So we're going to start right there um, at the end of the 1920s. And again, we're looking at the causes and effects of the Great Depression. So there's three main um historical developments you want to be aware of as I go through this information. And these are the three big ideas you want to take from, from this information. So the first one is that um, through the 1920s and even during the Great Depression and in the 1930s, the U.S. continued to transition from a rural agricultural economy um, to an urban industrial economy that's led by big businesses. Um, the second idea is that with this Great Depression, there was a lot of credit and market instability. Um, so this credit and market instability led many people to start to call for a stronger financial regulatory system. So we're going to see that through this Great Depression, there's more of a rejection of the idea of laissez-faire economics, and people will begin to embrace the idea that government will um, regulate the financial system of the country. And then the third big idea is that because of the suffering during the 1930s, policymakers are going to respond to mass unemployment and the social upheaval by transforming the U.S. government or the U.S. society into a limited welfare state. And that's going to redefine the goals or the ideas of American liberalism. So one of the big outcomes of this Great Depression is that people will begin to expect the government to take a more active role um, in things like depressions. So these are our big three, and I'll put this up at the end and we'll, we'll review it. But let's take a look at some of the causes of the Great Depression. So one of the things we want to understand in the Great Depression is that capitalism has a natural cycle of boom and bust. So when we're looking here, this trend line shows us the booms or the peaks and the bust or the depressions. Um, and we the cycle occurs naturally in a capitalistic economy. So what we're looking at here um, is the cycle from World War I to World War II. So right here, 1914 to 1917, we can see the U.S. economy is growing and moving towards what we would call prosperity. And this is in large part because of all of the production of World War I. So the U.S. is producing all of the war supplies and food and things needed by countries in Europe. And then once the U.S. joins the war in 1917, um, we see that even accelerate more. So we're seeing um, quite a lot of economic growth and a peak during World War I. But as World War I ended, um, those markets for war go goods disappeared. So all of the manufacturers that were making items for um, the war, they have to actually kind of draw down their production. And at the same time, 
we have those um, individuals who had been serving as soldiers and support personnel in World War I coming back into the U.S. economy and looking for jobs. So we have two things happening at the same time. Production is decreasing or declining, and the labor force is increasing as those as demobilization of the war effort occurs. So they're coming back in, and we see for a brief bit slowdown in the economy and a small, it doesn't last very long, but a small depression, post-war depression um, in 1921. So this right here helps explain some of the nativism um, that was happening in the early 1920s, some of the fear of communism. It's because there was some economic instability right here. People were afraid they would lose their jobs. Um, but this, like I said, this depression was fairly short lived. And so we start to see by 1922 recovery. So this right here, our Y is recovery. So we start to see recovery. The U.S. economy recovers, um, starts to like climb out of this trough, I guess, right? And we reach peak prosperity between 1925 and 1929. So this is um, an economy driven by a lot of um, manufacturing. We have industrialization occurring. There's a credit economy. People are borrowing it. They're buying things like radios, um, household items. Then we have peak prosperity here. And then the United States begins to slip into a recession. And this is really happening. Um, it's starting to happen like 1928, end of 1928. Um, and those, oops, those people that are in um, the financial sector, they know that this is coming, but they don't know when, and they're trying to stave it off. But by September of 1929, it's clear that the economy is sliding into recession. Um, the stock market crash that we talk about, that actually happened um, in October of 1929. Um, and then we have depression and the worst years of this Great Depression are 1923 to 1933. So we have this depression here um, and we're gonna talk about the kind of the effects and what people's lives were like during this depression in 1933. And then we see the economy begin to work towards recovery, but recovery is not going to be fully achieved until World War II. Um, but we're going to learn about Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his programs called the New Deal right here. But we see the economy begin to climb out of this um, this dis depression, um, but the, we won't achieve full recovery or another period of prosperity until the manufacturing and production of World War II. So this is our this is kind of our uh, economic cycle of capitalism. So we have prosperity, recession, depression, which is a prolonged period of um, economic retraction, recovery, and back to prosperity. So we see this cycle go. Um, if we look through the economic history of the United States, you can see this cycle, but the trend line is a trend of upward or profit, right? A trend of profit over time. So in 1928, we're going to look at the presidential election of 1928. Um, in 1928, we have the election of Herbert Hoover, who uh, had not really been Sorry, he had not really been a uh, an elected candidate before, but he had a lot of political experience. But if we're looking at this map in 1928, we can see that the American people really um, had a lot of confidence in the Republican Party, and they had a lot of confidence in Herbert Hoover. So he won this um, election resoundingly. He had 83% of the electoral vote. Um, and 58% of the popular vote, which is really a very large margin of the popular vote. Um, the only place he did not solidly win is in the South. And this is because the South was the solid South for the Democrats. And this is something that had happened during Reconstruction. So you can see that um, a large portion of Southern states voted for the Democratic candidate. So Herbert Hoover, if we're looking at him, this is one of his campaign posters. Um, he ran and he ran on the ideas of economic stability. He had a vision for the future. Um, he had integrity and he had experience. And people called him the boy wonder. 
Um, Herbert Hoover had been an orphan growing up, doesn't have a wealthy family, but by the time he's running for president, he had become a self-made millionaire. So they trusted his business acumen. He also had a lot of political experience. However, he had never been elected to anything before. So he had served in the um, administrations of Wilson. So he had been basically the food czar during World War I. So he was the one overseeing uh, food programs that were encouraging people to grow their own gardens. Um, and he was also directing commercial agriculture. So he was directing farmers how much to grow, of what and where to send it. And then um, he had never been elected. He also served as cabinet position. Um, he served in cabinet positions for Harding. And then when Harding uh, died in office and Calvin Coolidge takes over, he continued those positions for Calvin Coolidge. So he had a lot of experience, but president was his first elected position. Um, and he said this in his inaugural speech. He says, ours is a land rich in resources, stimulating in its glorious beauty, filled with millions of happy homes, blessed with comfort and opportunity. I have no fears for the future of our country. It is bright with hope. So his inaugural speech, he basically says, we are heading into a time of permanent prosperity. And he would have given the speech in March of 1929. Um, so he's elected in November of 1928. Or sorry, he's elected in November of 19, yes, elected November 1928, and then he's giving his speech in March of 1929, and then the economy crashes in October of 1929. So he really only had six months of presidency that was not defined by the Great Depression. Um, so... Um, if we're looking at causes of this Great Depression, this isn't necessary. This isn't caused by presidents or any one um, thing. But when we're looking at what was going on in the 1920s economy that led to this depression, um, we see that there's a major uh, maldistribution of wealth. So too much money is going into the hands of the wealthy, and um, the lower class part of the economy is not getting this wealth. Um, so. You know, we're, we're seeing about a third of the nation's money supply, maybe more, is locked away into the bank accounts of the wealthy. So it's just sitting there and it's not doing anything. It doesn't circulate in the economy. Um, and so it's, it's just an artificial damper on economic activity. Okay. Um, so you can see just a tenth of a percent of the population is holding a third of the wealth in the nation. Uh, there's also an overexpansion of credit purchases, and this is happening in the middle class mainly. Um, so what we're seeing is uh, manufacturers are offering very easy terms um, on things like radios, household goods, cars and automobiles, um, very easy terms, which are causing people to live beyond their means. Um, and so... They, the, the prosperity of the 1920s, you know, all of this economic activity, it's really a credit bubble. It doesn't represent real, um, complete spending. Okay, we also have, uh oh, okay, we also have, um, in the U.S. economy during the 1920s an overproduction. So this is caused um, in part by the industrialization and the improvement of manufacturing methods. So production of new products is outstripping consumers' ability to pay for these items. So once people have extended themselves fully on credit, they can no longer buy anymore. So there's no more ability to pay for items. So as we move through the 1920s, as you get to like 1926, 1927, 1928, people are not able to buy as much uh, because they've already extended themselves as far as they can. Um, there's also the laissez-faire policies of the Republican governments in the 1920s. They're placing a little bit too much faith in business to regulate the economy. Businesses are motivated to make money. They're not motivated necessarily to make sure that the whole economic system is healthy. Um, and so what we see is some imbalances like the easy credit terms. Okay. Um, and along with this, another political cause of this Great Depression is the reliance of the Republicans of the 1920s to pass high protectionist tariffs. 
They're trying to protect United States manufacturers, um, enable United States manufacturers to make more wealth. But this is causing a dampening of foreign trade, which means that there aren't as many uh, markets available to American uh, manufacturers. So once American consumers are unable to buy any more products because they've overextended themselves, the uh, manufacturers are also not able to take their products on the foreign markets and seek new markets to sell. Um, so one example of that, um, there's Mac- the Ford and McCumber tariff in the 1920s was a 38.5% tariff, um, which meant that, you know, and we've, we've looked at tariffs quite a lot. That meant that American manufacturers are... Uh, really push having to compete internationally and because of this high tariff the goods internally in the united states are increasing in price for american consumers as well okay uh the farming sector the farming sector actually really um their depression began more like 1925 or 1926 so in the farming sector uh crop prices drop because of overproduction and it has to do with new farm machinery but this two, new farm machinery is kind of a double-edged sword for farmers. So it is causing, um, it's causing farmers to have to buy and finance this new machinery. And then in turn, they're producing more and more and more of their agricultural product, which is causing the price that they can demand for this product to decline because they're overproducing or causing um, an oversupply of of goods and then they also have to pay off that farm equipment so what we see uh beginning in the mid-1920s in the agricultural sector is a large number of foreclosures and um, many rural banks going over because they've lended to farmers and then farmers don't pay back the money and the bank ends up um, going under so about six thousand rural banks go under um, in the last years of the 1920s Okay, and then we also see as this decade goes on and we come to the end of the 1920s, we see technological unemployment, which um, is a term used for when people are replaced by machines. So this has to do again with the improvement in manufacturing systems. So as the assembly line um, becomes more complex and becomes more sophisticated, the people working in those assembly lines are replaced by machines. Um, so we start to see a technological unemployment rate increase in the late 1920s. So all these things are in place um, in the 1920s, but a lot of people are unaware of them. And a lot of people, especially in the middle class, are um, speculating in the stock market. So this is probably um, this is the cause of this depression that kind of tipped tip the scales, right? So we have an unsound stock market. Um, and what that means is the stock people are trading in the stocks, they're trying to make quick uh, a quick amount of money, um, and they're speculating, meaning um, they're not looking at long-term investment. They're trying to put their money in the market, see an improvement or see an increase, take their money out of the market and make a quick profit. Um, and as they do that, they start to buy on margin, which means buying stocks on credit. So they were borrowing money or they were only putting a portion of their money down on stock purchases. So stock brokers would say, why don't you give me 20, 30, 40 percent? Um, towards the end, some of the worst margin purchases were a 10 percent um percent down uh, margin purchase and so the middle class is speculating with this idle money or extra money that they have and they're putting it into the stock market and they feel like they're going to get rich but as too many margin purchases are made um, by the late 1920s it's clear that the stock market is not actually growing with wealth it's just um, a really large debt bubble as well. And so when people can't pay these margin purchases off, that's when we see the stock market crash. Okay, so what we see as we go through this Great Depression is a kind of negative cycle that leads us in depression. So as share prices fall, people panic and they begin selling their shares for a loss. Um, they're unable to pay off their margin purchases, and that's going to lead to less trade which will lead to less money for banks, 
which will lead to factories closing, increased unemployment. As people become unemployed, they can't spend money. Um, when there's no money circulating the economy, more factories close and more unemployment. And we get into this, this loop down here where there's no easy answer on how to solve this depression. Okay, what this is, is basically um, the economy needs an infusion of cash. Um, you know, cash is kind of like jump starting the economy. Um, the economy needs an infusion of cash, but it's just contracting and contracting and contracting. And um, basically the economy becomes frozen. So these trends here kind of give us an idea of what was happening. Right, so we look at unemployment um, from 1925 to 1933. Unemployment holds pretty stable and at a fairly low rate in the 1920s. But you can see in 1928, it starts to increase. This is probably some of that technological unemployment. And then when the stock market crashes in October of 1929, um, businesses basically lose all of their capital. And so we start to see many sectors of the economy laying people off and we just see unemployment increase and increase and increase over time. So the peak unemployment rate was reached in 1933. So um, what we see here is about a 25% unemployment rate officially. So of people seeking jobs, one in four of them are unemployed by 1933. Um, this is where we can see the um, depression kind of starting early in the agricultural economy under wheat prices, uh, you can see that the price per bushel, um, it was at about a dollar and a half in 1925. And then we have a pretty steady decline in price per bushel through the last years of the 1920s. So this is where we're seeing farmers unable to make money that they still have to pay off those purchases of farming equipment that they made maybe in World War One or the beginning in the 1920s. So they still have large debts to pay off, but they're not making as much money for um, their agricultural product. And then it just continues to decline um, as we get into, uh, you know, the actual what we would call the Depression years. And you can see the stock market crash on this one here, right? So prices are steadily increasing and then the bottom falls out on the stock market. Um, and then bank closures, this one is very, uh, very significant. So what we're looking here is the number of banks that are failing or bank suspensions, um, holding pretty steady through the 1920s. And then we see it increase um, in the number of banks that are failing. And we hit a peak of about 4,000 banks failing in 1933. So the banking sector, during these Great Depression years of 1930 through 1933, the banking sector completely froze. We had what's called a credit freeze. Nobody could um, get loans. And if you can't get loans, you can't start businesses. So the economy had frozen up here. Okay, one of the things we're looking at with bank failures in the 1920s is there was no safety net for these banks. So when, um, when a bank failed, the money was just gone. There's no insurance to ensure that people who deposit their money in banks are going to get it out. And so what would happen is you would have this um, rumor start about a bank, right? If a bank is in trouble, somebody would say, so this one here, American Union Bank, uh, people might have said, uh, American Union, there's a run on the bank. People are taking all of their deposits out of the bank. And we can see all these people lined up here. They're lined up trying to get into the bank and get their cash out of the bank before the bank has to close down. Um, if the bank runs out of cash, the money's gone. Um, so any of these people left standing out here on the sidewalks, they've just lost all of their deposits. So if they have a few thousand dollars in this bank, um, if the bank closes, even though that money was on their ledgers, that, that money's gone. And so um, this was a major loss of wealth for the American people. This is affecting individual people as these banks are failing. And so we can see between 1929 and 1932, over 4,000 banks failed. Um, and so this is, you know, this is catastrophic. Um, and then we also see one of the other effects of this is that people quit going to school. So about 80,000 college students drop out of school, which means in a long term sense, there's a sort of brain drain on the United States. These are people who would have been seeking professional positions. So future doctors or future 
future attorneys, uh, future accountants. Um, they drop out of school. And so they're actually, what they're doing is we're seeing um, people being shifted from easy or solid middle class positions into a more working class position. Okay, I mentioned unemployment. Um, unemployment, the official unemployment rate in 1933 was 25%, or one out of four people are unemployed if they're seeking a job. But when we measure employment statistics, um, or unemployment statistics, what we measure are the people who are actively seeking employment. So the real unemployment rate was actually probably higher, maybe uh, 33% to 40%, because it, this unemployment rate doesn't measure the people who had given up trying to find a job. So they were unemployed, but they were no longer seeking work. They weren't trying anymore. Um, this uh, picture here gives us kind of an image of what people were looking for. Right, this man's holding a sign that says, work is what I want and not charity. Who will help me get a job? Seven years in Detroit, which means he was an auto worker. No money, sent away, furnish the best of references. So he, he says, I'll give you uh, good references and has his phone number written on the bottom. So he's just standing on the side of the road seeking work. Um, and this was something that people would have seen. Okay, people would have stood in line for help with all of this. So we have things like bread lines and soup kitchens cropping up. Um, state and local government tries to help people who are out of work, but they very quickly ran out of funds. Um, and we see a number of private charities also um, try to help. So we have soup kitchens, bread lines run by churches, local food banks. But again, um, these are kind of precarious because it depends on how much money those communities have to help. And in the instance of state and local governments, they only have as much money as people pay in taxes. So as unemployment increases, that means the states and local governments are bringing in less and less dollars in tax revenue. And so that means less and less that they can help people with. And states and local governments are not allowed to spend into a deficit. They cannot spend more than they have. So this, uh, this temporary form of relief was really very precarious. Okay, we see a lot of poverty during the Great Depression. So some statistics that show this would be, um, you know, if we look at New York City, one out of five children in New York City are suffering from malnutrition in these years, meaning they don't have enough to eat. And families can't afford rent, right? So before they slide all the way into homelessness, families usually move in with friends or relatives. And so we see um, many, many places where people are living together, multiple families living together in one apartment. Um, teenagers were especially um, kind of in a precarious position here because teenagers were old enough to work, uh, but not, they weren't going to be hired very easily because the jobs generally went to adults first. And so a lot of teenagers, um, saw their families in these uh, situations and they would leave home, right? They'd leave home and go try to find work um, as a way to try to support their family. They, um, African Americans were generally the first to lose their jobs. So in some places, their unemployment rate was as high as 50% in some cities. And if you remember, World War I, um, provided opportunities for African Americans. The manufacturing World War I provided opportunities. So African Americans were moving from southern um, states and trying to escape things like Jim Crow and sharecropping by moving into places like Detroit to work in the auto industry. Um, and that began in the middle of the 19-teens. So this great migration of the previous decade meant about one out of seven African Americans had moved to these northern and western industrial cities. And then um, when the layoffs began uh, during the Great Depression, African-Americans were often the first to lose their jobs. So we see that African-Americans um, were, you know, disproportionately impacted. Another group that was impacted by the Great Depression um, are Mexican-Americans. And we see things in places like Los Angeles, where anybody who appeared to be Mexican-American, whether they were a citizen or not, um, there's times when they were actually just rounded up and put onto trains and sent to Mexico. And we had a, um, you know, 
thousands of American citizens were illegally deported during the Great Depression because they were Mexican-American and sent on trains and sent back to Mexico, even though they were American citizens. Um, they were just racially profiled and sent, sent back to Mexico. Okay, there's hopelessness, um, a general sense of hopelessness during this time. So one of the demographic trends we see is that marriage and birth rates drop. Um, people waited. They didn't want to have families. They didn't want to have children in this kind of a, a financial situation. So they waited to start families or they waited to get married until their finances improved. So we see a, um, a drop in the birth rate during the 1930s. And this photo you've probably seen before, it's one of the most famous photos of the Great Depression. It was taken by a woman named Dorothea Lang. And we'll talk a little bit more about her. I have an image of her later on. But she was a photographer hired by the U.S. government um, in the mid 1930s to document the suffering of this nation. And this woman here is, um, she's a, the photograph is called Migrant Mother, but she's a woman who was displaced by both the depression and the Dust Bowl, um, which we'll also take a look at. Okay, and there's a lot of irony in all of this. This photograph shows people waiting in a bread line. They're waiting for, um, for food, for a handout, in front of this billboard of the 1920s, um, you know, which says this is the the world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way, and so this is what people are seeing um, in 1930, 1931, 1932. This is no longer this billboard is no longer the American way. Um, the American way during this Great Depression is waiting in bread lines, being unemployed, not having money. Um, and so they turn this to their politicians. So we're going to see how, how the American people to begin to demand more, especially from the federal government because of all of this. Okay, um, happening at the same time <laughs> in this Great Depression is something called the Dust Bowl. Um, and in the Dust Bowl, there was a prolonged time of drought in the American Midwest. And this is, uh, part of this is natural, right? There just wasn't enough rain. But then the other issue is this is a result of people practicing unsustainable farming in the Midwest on the Great Plains. So they were not rotating crops. They weren't resting their fields. And they had depleted the soils to the point where a windstorm could come in and blow all of the topsoil away. Um, so this is a picture of one of these dust storms that they call black blizzards. And if you read um, Of Mice and Men in your ninth grade English class, for example, um, that book by John Steinbeck is a Great Depression novel. It's following um, Lenny and George, who are um, migrants who had been displaced and were in California working as migrant farmhands um, in, because of this Great Depression or this uh, Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl occurred um, in this area on this map. So you can see right here, it stretches um, the entire Midwest, but the most severe location was in um, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, Texas. So this red line here shows us the most severe um, area of the Dust Bowl. So we have prolonged drought. The farmers um, that were producing here were not planting fallow fields, right? They were leaving fields just plowed over and bare. Um, they were growing the same crops over and over and over again, which were depleting um, different minerals out of the crops. And so it's leaving the topsoil exposed. And so when this drought occurs with these windstorms, um, this basically the fields just blow away. Um, and there's stories of people in the eastern part of the United States being able to look up and see the dust blowing in the sky from this Dust Bowl area. Um, so if we look, I have some photos of what this Dust Bowl looks like. Um, right here we have a picture of, you can see this, this uh, shed um, with the door on it, and you can see that the dust is blown up to the point where this door can't be opened. Right, so as this happens, these farmers leave their their fields. Um, they can't pay their bills, and they they move. And a lot of them end up in California or here in Washington State, where they're what you call like fruit tramps, meaning they're going field to field and following the harvest. 
So in the wintertime, they'd start in Southern California. And then as the season progresses, they move northward um, and they would end up somewhere like Washington, like in Wenatchee or something, harvesting apples in the fall. And then they go back along um, and southward in the winter. And so they're following the harvest seasons, trying to find work. So they're working as migrant farmers. Um, and these are called Okies from that's the most common term from Oklahoma, the Okies. But there were also Arkies and Texies. And this is an image of one of these black blizzards blowing up, right? So you can see, they could see on the horizon, this storm coming in and it would just engulf everything and it was dark and black. And then as, um, as the storm moves through, this is an image of, you know, this is an image of the dust that had blown in. And so we can see drifts of dirt just covering this, this vehicle here and this wagon. Um, and so it, it leaves people to move around. Right. So we, this is a common scene, these migrant workers um, moving through. And that image I showed you of the migrant mother, she was one of those um, migrant people. They would just load everything up they had onto their their vehicles and drive away. Um, they just leave their farms, um, drive away from the bank, drive away from the debts and go seek work. Um, and. You know, just in general, we see a lot of suffering during this Great Depression. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting to me is the number of teenagers who become homeless and ride the rails. So these images here show teenagers. They're, they're jumping onto the trains and they're traveling town to town to try to, uh, try to find work. Um, and they're riding the railroads. And this was just a very common thing to see. So we see from 19, you know, the end of 1929 to 1933, um, an increase in hopelessness, probably about a fourth of the people in the United States just like sitting, waiting, trying to find work. They can't find anything. Um, and you can just imagine the hopelessness that would exist for people who are, you know, they just don't feel like their life is going anywhere. There's no possibility. There's no, no path for them to become prosperous. There is a wealthy and privileged class at the time. Um, that is really untouched by this depression. So the Carnegies and Rockefellers, they don't really feel this depression, but, um, you know, they do try to give. So we see that in New York City, for example, um, in 1930, there's 4.5 million in charitable contributions made. In 1932, 2.1 million. So people increased the amount they were giving away, but it just wasn't enough. Um, and, the economy is so broken down, it's so uncoordinated. We have things like one in five children in New York City suffering from malnutrition. And then in the West on the farms, the prices had gotten so low for people's products they're producing that they just throw it away. So this image here um, is showing the food surplus. These farmers can't sell this milk, so they're dumping it on the ground. <laughs> Um, but there's kids in the eastern cities that are starving. There's also stories of ranchers in the West killing their entire herds because they can't afford to feed um, feed their cattle or feed their pigs. Um, and so they just slaughter them all. Um, and that doesn't get, you know, there's, it's so uncoordinated. People aren't getting what they need. Okay, um, this is Dorothea Lang. She's a photographer that... Um, between 1935 and 1940, traveled the country taking pictures. And she was paid to do this by, by the federal government as part of Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, so we have thousands upon thousands of photographs. And it's not just Dorothea Lang. There were many photographers hired to do this. So this is a period in U.S. history that is very well documented with primary sources and visual images. Okay, um, this image here is one of my favorites. Um, this is a shanty town or what became called a Hooverville in Seattle. So if we're looking at this image here, these houses are built out of basically whatever people can find. So scrap lumber um, and they've built these houses here. And this is actually down by the Seattle Pier. So um, if we were looking at this right now, Century League Stadium would be probably right about here in this image. Um, I have, let me see. Yeah, I have another image of it. So if we're looking here, we can use 
Uh, this building is our um, kind of uh, like point of reference, right? So we have this building right here. You can see that sitting right here. So this Hooverville is built right around here along First Street in Seattle. And this Hooverville stayed until after World War II. So people lived here um, through the entire Great Depression. And then at the end of World War II, the Seattle government went in and burned this down. And there was a similar Hooverville in um, in Tacoma, down by the pier in Tacoma as well. And these cropped up across the country. People who were homeless had nowhere to live, so they would um, squat on public land. So there, there were Hoovervilles in Central Park, um, and these were all across the country. Um, and this is what many people were reduced to. They didn't have anywhere to live, so they, they use whatever they can find, and they build these homes. Um, as the suffering got worse, people blamed this on President Hoover, right? That's why those shanty towns are called Hoovervilles. Um, so there's a lot of blame on President Hoover. So one of the things we want to look at is how did Hoover respond to this? So Hoover's response, um, because he, he was president for the first three and a half years of this depression. Um, his first response was to tell people to practice rugged individualism. So he says, pull up your bootstraps. We're going to work our way out of this. And uh, he did things like, you know, he says, we're all going to have to make sacrifices. So he said, I will um, forego 25% of my salary as well. So I'm going to sacrifice 25% of my salary and we're going to be rugged individuals. Um, and this didn't work because you can, there are plenty of people willing to work, but if there weren't jobs available, you can't really work your way out of the depression. He also tried voluntary cooperation. So he urged owners of successful banks, for example, to loan money to the failing banks. Um, but he was asking for them to do this voluntarily. So there's no incentive for these banks to do this. So if you were a successful bank, loaning money to a failing bank was a really good way to make sure that your successful bank was also going to fail. So his request of voluntary cooperation didn't work. Um, and then he also, this is probably what many historians say is one of the worst actions he took. Um, he tried to protect U.S. manufacturers even more by um, championing and signing in a new tariff, a Holly Smoot tariff is what it's called. Um, and that's, that's the politicians. We have Holly and Smoot were the writers of this, this bill for the tariff. Um, and they raised the tariff rates to nearly 60%. So the purpose here was to protect American businesses, but what it actually did was completely halt and stop trade from happening um, globally. So this Holly Smoot tariff um, took whatever global trade was occurring and basically froze it and shut down global trade in a time when people really needed trade. Um, businesses needed people to buy goods and that the tariff shut that trade down. Okay, Hoover um, also tried to stimulate the economy directly by putting government money into, um, into the U.S. economy. So his theory or his philosophy is something called trickle-down economics. So he supported the creation of something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And this was a government program that was meant to give loans to government businesses. And his idea was, we'll give government money to these businesses, and then it will, those businesses will use that money to invest and expand their factories, which is going to create new jobs, which means we're going to have more wages in circulation, and then demand is going to increase. So this RFC or Reconstruction Finance Corporation issued loans to banks, railroads, other big businesses. And the really the hope is that this is going to trickle down through the economy. But what a lot of these companies did with these loans is they used it to pay off debts they already had. Um, and these loans ended up rather than um, leading to new investment and factory expansion, it propped up the businesses, but it did not lead to new jobs and it did not lead to more wages and circulation. So many people view this as um, a like just a bailout of the big businesses. So these programs are targeted to help the wealthy. And then in 
laissez-faire economic fashion, the belief was the wealthy were then going to help everybody else out. Um, so the critics of this, basically, they call it the millionaire's dole. This is just doling out money to millionaires rather than helping the people who actually needed it. So this makes Uber um, look pretty bad, right? This doesn't really help. It's seen as too little, too late. If he had done this at the very beginning, this might have worked. But this Reconstruction Finance Corporation is coming in in 1932, and people say it's too little, too late. Uh, the economy is already frozen. Okay. Oh, I numbered these wrong. But Hoover also supports a bill that gave the RFC the power to loan money to states to provide le relief for the needy. So his idea here is government will build projects and this will create jobs for people. So it finances some public work projects. So the Hoover Dam, for example, um, that's a project that was started under the RFC while Hoover is president, which is why it is named for him. So we have a picture here of the Hoover Dam. Um, but again, seen as too little too late. So this is a good idea. Uh, we'll see that Roosevelt builds off of this idea, or this is along the line of what um, Franklin Roosevelt later will do. Um, but again, it just uh, a lot of people now say this wasn't enough. Okay, um, as we come up to 1932, this is an election year. So Hoover has to run for re-election this year. And what we see here is, um, Hoover has a bit of a scandal to deal with. So in the summer of 1932, there is um, a group of men that march on the Capitol in Washington called the Bonus Army. And there's about 43,000 marchers. Um, 17,000 of these are World War I veterans. And what happened is as a condition of these World War I veterans service in World War I, they were promised a bonus of $5,000. Um, that was going to be paid to them in 1945 as a type of retirement account. So they served in the war in 1918, 1917, and then in 1945, they were going to get this bonus from the U.S. government. Um, but in 1932, these men marched on Washington, D.C., and they were telling basically Hoover, right, they're marching on the federal government. They were saying, pay us our bonuses now. We don't need our bonus in 1945. We need our bonuses now. And um, Hoover, you know, and we can see them camped here and sleeping in front of the Capitol building. Um, we see tents here and what looks like police. Hoover refused to meet with these people. He refused to address them at all. And he ordered the Capitol police to remove them from federal property by force. And so what we get are images like this, where we have government police fighting against veterans who had gone to war for the United States. And in an election year, this just looks very, very bad for Herbert Hoover. Um, so the, the bonus army is removed by force. And then in the fall of 1932, Hoover is up for re-election. And he is facing um, an opponent, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's the governor of New York at the time. So it's a battle between two philosophical camps. How do you respond to the Great Depression? And Hoover is distressed. He thinks that misery is all around him and that people were giving up, right? He wanted the individual spirit to get America out of financial crisis. He didn't want the government doling out help and giving out welfare to the American people. Um, and he was saying things in this election like prosperity is just around the corner if we just if we just keep at this. Um, and he, he even declared the depression over in 1932, which many people just, you know, they said, no, that this depression's not over. I still don't have a job. Right. So um, he declared the depression is over. So when it comes time to vote, the American people resoundingly chose Roosevelt over Hoover. Um, and this is our election result with Roosevelt. So if we look at this, you can see Roosevelt wins 89 percent of the electoral vote. So he actually just trounces Herbert Hoover in this. Um, you, a few states choose Hoover, but mostly, you know, we see Roosevelt wins uh, very resoundingly. If we want to do a comparison, this was Hoover's election in 1928. Hoover had a lot of promise. People were very optimistic in 1928. They thought he was going to be a fantastic president. 
Um, but his real weakness is timing. So that economy crashes in October of 1929. Um, he's about six months into his term. And by 1932, the American people have decided he does not know what he's doing. He's not going to be able to get us out of this depression. And they choose the change candidate. They choose Roosevelt. So at the beginning, I'd say we'd look back at the three big ideas or the three major historical developments of understanding the causes and effects of the Great Depression. So if we look, number one, the U.S. continued to transition from rural agricultural economy to an urban industrial economy. Um, and when we're looking at the Great Depression, we see that some of the causes of the Great Depression had to do with this transition, things like technological unemployment or people buying on credit uh, from businesses who were offering easing lending terms. Uh, the second big idea is that the credit and market instability of the Great Depression led to calls for a stronger financial regulatory system. Um, we didn't talk a lot about that, but when you think of all of the, the suffering that's going on and the mass bank failures or the fraud or um, lying of stockbrokers and selling stock, we can see that the American people will begin to call on government to regulate the actions of individuals more in the financial sector. And then the third reason was that during the 1930s, policymakers responded to mass unemployment and social upheaval by transforming the U.S. into a limited welfare state. So we saw that um, as this depression began under Hoover, Hoover was not willing to transfer or transform the United States system to the limited welfare state. He relied on voluntary actions. Um, he gave government loans to big business. But people begin to call for government to take direct action and intervene to help individuals directly. So as we move into talking about the New Deal in the next video, we're going to see what this limited welfare state looks for, like. But um, this really is a transformation in the United States vision of or the United States citizens vision of the US system. They want to see a government based on um, laws that serve the people. So that's where we start to see a more modern idea of American liberalism. So um, take a look on Canvas for the next video, which will be on topic 7.10, the New Deal.